Vandaag bij Antwoorden met Belis Conley. If the enemy can steal away from our hearts the, the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus, we have nothing. Listen, take my life, strip it bare, but leave me the cross and leave me the resurrection, because without it, my faith is futile. Welkom bij Antwoorden met Belis Conley. Het leven kan soms een uitdaging zijn. Maar of het nu gaat om financiën, relaties, gezondheid of de vraag naar je doel in je leven, één ding is zeker. God ziet je. Hij houdt van je. En wat er ook aan de hand is, Hij heeft de antwoorden op je vragen. If you got a Bible, Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. And as you're finding Genesis 15, let me give you a little bit of context before we read. Here we're going to meet a man named Abram. Eventually, he will become Abraham, become one of the patriarchs of our faith. But in Genesis 15, it's early in his story. As a matter of fact, we first meet him in Genesis chapter 12. And God shows up to this man named Abram and says, hey, I got a promise for you. I need you to get up. I need you to go. Get out of the land where you are. I'm going to take you to a new place, to a new land. I'm going to give you that land. I'm going to bless those that bless you. I'm going to curse those that curse you. I'm going to give you great posterity. And out of you, I'm going to create a great nation. And what I love about Abram is that he responds in faith. He gets up and he begins to move forward toward this promised future. And over the next few chapters, we see his journey begin to unfold. And we see the ups and the downs of living a life of faith. In Genesis 12 through Genesis 15, you see quite a few events take place. On the positive side of the ledger, you see God truly do bless Abraham. You see him increase his possessions. You see God protect and rescue Abram time and time again. We see God's hand of favor upon him and his family. But then there are some downs in the life of faith. And on the negative side of the ledger, Abram endures famine. Abram at one point is embroiled in a political scandal, political drama with a world leader. He deals with Huge amounts of family drama and tension to the point where he and some family members end up separating. At one point, Abram has to engage in a military excursion to reclaim things that were stolen and taken from his family. And at the end of the day, by the time we arrive in Genesis 15, Abram still has no children. The promise of God giving him posterity has yet to come to fruition. And here in Genesis 15... It's been a decade since God first issued this promise to Abram. It's been a decade of Abram trying to hold on. It's been a decade of Abram trying to keep the faith. And as we find ourselves in Genesis 15, Abram is sitting in his tent and he's sulking. And he's airing his grievances out before God. And you can read it, but essentially what Abram says is, Hey, God, I, I thought this was going to play out differently I thought you would have fulfilled your word and your promise by now. But here I am. I'm sitting in this tent. I don't have any kids and I still don't have a land to call my own. And if that's you, if you can relate with that, look at what God does next. I love this. Genesis 15 and 5. God actually gets down into the tent with Abram. He gets in the tent. And I think that tent represents our limited perspective. Sometimes all we can see is what's right in front of us. Sometimes we feel hemmed in with four walls around us and we have no vision for the future. We're so locked into what is right in front of us. We feel like we are stuck. And perhaps in the midst of it, our perspective of God and his ability to perform his word has become stuck and hemmed in and limited. And this is why I love God. Because he's the God that comes down and gets into the tent of our lives. He comes and he visits us right in the midst of our limited perspective just to remind us of who he is. Genesis chapter 15, look at verse number five. I love this. It says, then God brought Abram outside and said, look now. Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And God said to Abram, so shall your descendants be. So he's reissuing the promise to Abram. Same promise he gave in Genesis 12. Look at verse 6. And Abram believed the Lord, and God accounted it to Abram for righteousness. I love this. God brings Abram outside of that limited perspective, brings him out of the tent and says, look now. He reissues the promise, and he reminds Abram that he has all power. 
and that he is goodness personified. And I love that the Bible says Abram believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And I believe that one of the things that God wants to do in this new year is to take us out of our tent, to take us out of our limited perspective and reveal to us afresh his goodness, his grace, his mercy, and his kindness. But in order to see that, and in order to experience his power and his promises, it's gonna require something of us. And this is the heart of what I wanna share today. Look at the next few verses, if you would. Genesis 15, look at verse number seven. Then God said to Abram, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans. I, came, or I brought you here to give you this land to inherit it. And Abram said, Lord God, how shall I know that I'll inherit it? Basically what he's saying is, look, after the decade I had, <laughs> you're gonna have to help me with this. Look what God says, verse number nine. So God said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then Abram brought all these things to God and he cut them in two. He cut them down the middle and he placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And then look at verse 11. Just circle this in your Bible if you got a pen. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Let, let me explain what we've just read so God reissues the promise. Abram believes God is accounted to him as righteousness. But then in order to confirm the promise, God and Abram make a covenant. And this covenant, it involves sacrifice. And when it comes to covenant, especially in the ancient world, what would happen, and we see this here, is you would take animals. In this case, it's a, it's a bull, it's a goat, and it's a ram. But you would take these animals and you would cut them in half and you'd place the pieces opposite each other. And then you and the other person making the covenant would walk between the animals. And it was as if you were saying, let it be to me just as it is to these animals if I don't fulfill my part of the bargain. So Abram prepares the sacrifice. What he is doing is absolutely sacred. He's about to enter into covenant with almighty God. And then notice what happens. The Bible says, immediately vultures come to steal the sacrifice. And I love verse 11. When the vultures came to steal the sacrifice, Abram drove them away. Now that word drove in the original language, it's a violent word. It, it, it means to fight. It means to repeatedly strike with blows. So Abram fought off these vultures. I promise there's a point here. If you study the scriptures, you'll find that Vultures and unclean birds are often a representation of demonic spirits and demonic forces. Think about the parable that Jesus told about the sower. A sower goes and sows seed and the seed falls in different places. One of the ways that that seed would get stolen was by the birds of the air, by these demonic forces. So here in Genesis 15, these vultures, they come to steal the sacrifice, but Abram fights them off. He wouldn't let them steal the sacrifice. And in like manner, and I feel by the spirit of God that I'm supposed to bring a message today called, it's time to fight. I feel like there are some sacred things that are under attack from the enemy. And it's high time for us as believers to fight. And if you'll allow me, what I want to do is talk about specific sacrifices that we're going to have to fight for, that we're going to have to contend for if we're going to see the promises of God come to fruition. Here's the first sacrifice. It's the most important. It's the most sacred of all sacrifices. We're going to have to fight for, we're going to have to contend for the sacrifice of Christ. Like I said, this is the most sacred of all sacrifices, but it's also the one that is most under attack. Why is that? Because Christ and him crucified, it's the substance and the sum of all of our faith. If the enemy can steal away from our hearts the, the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus, we have nothing. Listen, take my life, strip it bare, but leave me the cross and leave me the resurrection because without it, my faith is futile. You see, it's the sacrifice of Jesus that cleanses us from our sins. It's the sacrifice of Jesus that cleanses us from a guilty conscience. It's the sacrifice of Jesus that gives us new standing and right standing with God. It's what brings salvation. Listen to these words speaking about the sacrifice of Christ. Hebrews chapter nine, verse 26. Christ has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. 
To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Listen, you have to see this. You have to capture why the sacrifice of Christ is so important. It is our everything. And if it gets taken, we have no covenant with God. We have no eternal hope and we are dead in our sins. If the enemy can steal away from our hearts the sacrifice of Christ, he gets everything. So you better believe he's going to try. And in order to try and steal the sacrifice of Christ, he's going to send the vulture of persecution. He's going to send the vulture of persecution. Christian, make no mistake, persecution is coming. If we're honest, in a lot of regards, it's already here. So as believers, we better be ready to fight. Listen, following Jesus does not insulate us from trouble. It does not mean that there is a perfect, sinless, easy life ahead of us. No, it does not. If anything, following Jesus means the opposite is true. It means I will encounter persecution for my faith. I know that's not a popular theme to preach, but that is the truth. And if you heard something different, I'm sorry you got lied to. Jesus himself said in John 16 and 33, look, in me you have peace, but in the world... As long as you are on this sphere of a planet sucking oxygen, you will have trouble. You will face tribulation. You will have trials. Things will not always go your way. You will be persecuted, but he ends it with hope. He says, but have hope. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. <laughs> Following Jesus means you will get persecuted for your faith. And make no mistake, it takes courage to follow Jesus. It takes courage to fight and contend for the faith and for the truth. And without exaggeration, we as believers, we are in a battle and there are demonic forces at work right now trying to take us out. Listen, our battle is not against flesh and blood. People are not the enemy. Deception is the enemy. And there are demonic forces at work to try and steal and destroy our faith. They are working overtime to take out the church of Jesus Christ. You better be ready to fight. You better be ready to contend for the faith. And if you're not rooted and grounded in the truth of God's word, don't be surprised if you get bullied by the vulture of persecution. Don't be surprised if you find yourself falling away, slipping and distancing yourself from the faith. So how do I fight back against the vulture of persecution? You need power but not an earthly power, not a power that can be derived from human strength. You need a power that can only be supplied by the Holy Spirit. Listen to these words, Acts chapter one and verse eight. This is Jesus speaking and I paraphrase, but he said this, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Well, why do we need this power? Jesus says you need this power to be my witnesses throughout the earth. Think about the people Jesus is speaking to. He's speaking to his disciples. And he's saying, look, you need power. You need a way for the Holy Spirit because you can't be and you can't do all that I've called you to be and all that I've called you to do without the power and without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I've called you to be a witness of me, a witness for the gospel, a witness of the sacrifice of Christ in the earth. And because you are a witness, you will endure persecution. And if you are going to fight back the vulture of persecution, you better have some power on your side. You will not be able to be the person God has called you to be without the power of the Holy Spirit. And you think about each and every one of these disciples, every single one of them endured persecution and all but one of them lost their lives for the sake of Christ. And yet somehow we in our world today think we're just gonna waltz through life and everything's gonna be fine and everything's gonna work out. No, 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 that's not what Jesus, following Jesus is all about. Apostle Paul said it like this, we're living in the midst of a, a crooked and a perverse generation. In the midst of a crooked generation, it takes Holy Spirit power to find your courage. In the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation, it takes Holy Spirit power to find your voice. In the midst of darkness, it takes Holy Spirit power to shine, to be a light, to be a witness. Church, we're supposed to be the light of the world, a city that's set on a hill. It can't be hidden. You don't just light a lamp and then hide it. No, you put it on a lampstand so everyone around can see it. So let me ask you, honest question. 
How's your light? How's your connection to the Holy Spirit? Because if you're going to contend for the faith, if you're going to fight, if you're going to stand out in the midst of darkness, if you're going to show the world a different way, if you're going to show the world a better way, you better make sure you're anointed by the Holy Spirit. And hear me, the anointing is not just for pastors and preachers. The anointing is for all believers. But here's the thing. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is only found, maintained, and fortified in one place, in the place of prayer. And you need the anointing. You will not be an effective parent without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You will not be able to raise your children in the midst of this generation without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You will not be an effective spouse without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You will not be an effective businessman or employee without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Young person, you will not be an effective student on your campus without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's the anointing that marks you. It's the anointing that sets you apart. But it's only found in one place, in the place of prayer. So when's the last time you shut off the world? You turned off your phone. You turned off the tablet. You turned off the TV. And you got on your knees and got alone with God and began to cry out and say, oh, Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit, anoint me for the task ahead. Holy Spirit, anoint me afresh today because I want to bear witness for the name of Jesus. When's the last time you spent the day praying in tongues? Every few minutes, praying in tongues under your breath, driving to work, driving to pick up your kids from school. When's the last time you spent some time praying in the Holy Spirit? Listen, friends, you need the anointing. You need the power that the Holy Spirit can bring. If you don't, you're going to get bullied by the vulture of persecution. So how's your prayer life? How's your connection to the Holy Spirit? The famous preacher, Leonard Ravenhill, he said it like this. The Christian that is not praying is straying. Church, it's time to fight. We need to contend for the sacrifice of Christ, and we need to be ready to fight off the vulture of persecution. The second thing we're going to need to contend for this year is the sacrifice of our lives. The sacrifice of our lives. If you've got your Bible, Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12. Apostle Paul writing here, familiar verse of scripture, but I want to read it to you anyway. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Our bodies are to be living sacrifice. In other words, if you call Jesus Lord, you now recognize that your life is no longer your own. You have been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus. You belong to him, and now your life exists to be lived for his purposes and for his glory. When I think about a living sacrifice, I think even in terms of marriage, it's not a perfect example, but I think you'll get the point. When I said yes to my wife, I said no to everybody else. And in so doing, my perspective changed. No longer was my life about my selfish desires, about my selfish nature, my wants, my needs. No. Now her relationship takes precedence over those things. I put her wants, her desires, and her needs above my own because my devotion is no longer to self, but to her. And in the same way, when we come into relationship with Jesus, we die to our right of independent living. Our devotion now belongs to him. It means, Jesus, I choose you above all others. It's your way. It's your dreams. It's your plans. It's your purposes in my life. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice. It says, Jesus, you have all of me. And there's nothing I withhold from you. And make no mistake, the enemy of our soul would like nothing more than to try and steal away from us the sacrifice of our lives. Why? Because if he can get that sacrifice, he'll steal away our effectiveness as believers in the earth. You'll become, as Pastor B says, a high-maintenance, low-impact Christian. And in order to 
come and steal away the sacrifice and the devotion of our lives, the enemy oftentimes will send the vulture of compromise. The vulture of compromise. And compromise, it's a sneaky thing. It always starts small. It's almost undetectable. It's a little choice here, a little distraction over there, a little complacency, a little idleness in the moment. But before you know it, your spiritual walk with God is not where it once was, where suddenly Jesus and his sacrifice doesn't affect your heart the way that it used to. And yeah, you still believe in him. And yeah, you still believe that he loves you and that he died for you. But somewhere along the way, the gospel has lost its power in your life and your passion for Jesus has begun to wane. That's why the apostle Paul said in Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. And there's some that are sitting here. There's some that are listening. And the power of the gospel has lost its effect on your heart where the grace and the mercy of God have just become a memory and not a daily encounter. Christian, beware of the vulture of compromise because it seeks to steal and to diminish your impact and your influence as a believer in the earth. It wants to take you out from fighting the good fight. But like I said, compromise, it's a sneaky thing. It gets you off course a little bit at a time. Listen, have we lost our moral influence in the world? Because as believers, we say one thing, but oftentimes our individual lives paint a very different picture. And because of compromise, have we lost our ability to call out sin in society? Have we lost our ability to say what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's evil, what's truth and what's a lie? Man, I don't know everything, but I know this. The church of Jesus Christ was never meant to be weak and or paltry. But yet Christians are acting defeated. Christians are acting like victims and it drives me crazy because it's not in our nature. We're not victims, we're victors. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And we've not been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. So the question becomes, how do I fight? How do I fight off the vulture of compromise? Two things, repent and return. Return to the first things. You'll know these verses. Jesus spoke them. Revelation chapter two, speaking to his church. Nevertheless, I have this against you. That you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and return. Do the first works or else I'll come to you quickly and I'll remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Repent. Yes, it means to turn from your sin, but more than that, it means to turn to Jesus. That's the picture it paints, turning back to Jesus. And when you turn to Jesus, inevitably you turn away from sin. Repenting says, God, my life is not currently in alignment with your word and your word is truth. So Holy Spirit, forgive me and quicken my spirit again. Put me back where I need to be. Need to repent. You also need to return. Return to the first works, to the first things, the things that you did at the beginning. The simple things, things like prayer, worship, things like reading your Bible, things like abiding. When's the last time you just sat still? Sat there to abide in the love of the Father. Just to sit. And reflect. And say, Jesus, I belong to you. If you'll do those first things again, Jesus will become precious to you once again. And you'll find the strength to fight off the vulture of compromise. My friend, we are living in a season when I believe God is calling all of his people to draw near to him. 
You know, the, the work of the enemy has become so obvious in the world, trying to, to corral and squelch the voice of the church, trying to draw people away from intimate fellowship with Jesus, draw people away from having the, the scripture as the final authority in their life. The assault is on, my friend, and you need to draw close to the Father. You need to sell out to Jesus Christ. You need to fill your heart and fill your life with the truth of God's word. And as Pastor Harrison was saying, you need to drive off, you know, those vultures of compromise and the, those other vultures that he spoke about. This is an hour of battle and we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the, the spiritual darkness, the rulers of this world, the apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter six. So like it or not, you are in a battle. And I pray that God would strengthen you as you turn your heart to him, that God would meet you in a miraculous way. My friend, he loves you and he is for you. Don't lose heart. Keep your trust in him. And as always, I wanted to take a moment and say thank you to those that give and support this broadcast. Because of what you do, we can take the gospel around the world. Thank you. We appreciate you so much. Heb je vragen over de uitzending of houd je iets bezig waarvoor we kunnen bidden? Schrijf ons dan of bel ons op. Ons team is er voor je. Wil je meer weten en op de hoogte blijven van antwoorden met Belis Kanli? Meld je dan aan voor de gratis maandbrief van Belis per e-mail of per post. God zegen.